Yo. What's up, guys? It's Kazi here. So, a few videos ago, I decided to list off a few terms of wrestling that people aren't too familiar with or probably should be familiar with. So, today I wanted to just add on to that list. There's a ton of wrestling terms that could be defined, to be honest. Like, I'm sure someone made a dictionary at some point, and if not, dibs. Before I start though, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's just been showing love and giving me advice and you know, just continuing to watch the video all the way through. Like, I really appreciate everyone. This is definitely just the start, but like this, this has been such a blast doing and I have fun with every video and I try and improve every video. So let me know in the comments if there are any other ideas that you guys have and I, I could definitely cover these topics. But without further ado, let's get to the terms, brodies. Okay guys, so I'm gonna start with the no-sell. A no-sell is pretty much when a wrestler's not reacting to his opponent's move. And to be honest, this is some low down disrespectful, you know? So not only is it obviously disrespectful to your opponent, but it's disrespectful to the entire industry. Like you're making a mockery of pretty much what these guys do for a living. You know what I mean? Like that's not something that should and ever really is taken lightly. Like wrestlers will get pissed if you are not selling their moves like okay for instance there was a episode of raw where jackass i believe hosted it if not they appeared a ton throughout the show and they were in the ring with umaga we got steve-o in the ring and yep he's just sitting there getting kicked by umaga getting thrown around and laughing and just like really not selling the moves so umaga starts hitting him even harder which caused steve-o to laugh even harder which caused Umaga to hit him even harder. And I believe this actually caused Steve-O to suffer a few injuries because Umaga was actually kicking his ass. Gotta sell those, man. Gotta sell for your opponent, man. Gotta do those. Okay, so next on the list, I have Tower of Doom spot. Now, you'll hear this probably thrown around just while somebody's breaking down a match. Oh, they did the Tower of Doom spot. And then they laid on the ground for a minute. This spot is typically done in like Fatal 4-Way matches, tag team matches, maybe triple threat matches, like a lot of multi-man matches, pretty much. It's when you probably have, it's when you have two opponents on the top rope and then say one opponent is going for a superplex off the top rope. In comes third opponent to give Mr. Superplex guy a power bomb. That's pretty much a Tower of Doom spot. It's when all three wrestlers are involved and it's a high impact moment, but it's typically done like that. It's it's a superplex into a power bomb. Sometimes it's like a double superplex and then a double power bomb at the end. They get really creative with it. Um, and it's one of the funnest spots in a match. Sometimes it's overdone. Like if you see too many of them, you'll be like, oh, they're going for that again. But like, it's a lot of times where it's done correctly and it looks fantastic so like i remember there was a streak where you would always see one on an nxt takeover this is in the black and gold days and like american alpha would always do them you got um ftr who used to always do them or the revival i'm sorry um diy used to always do them as well like aop just those tag team series that these guys used to have always consisted of a Tower of Doom spot at some point. All right, guys. So next on the list, we have Buried. Now, Buried is when a wrestler is pretty much supposed to win. And what I mean by supposed to win, I don't mean like booking wise they were supposed to win. But I do kind of mean booking wise, like it makes the most sense for this person to win. And the person of the most power between the situation between the two wrestlers decides they want to win and they decide they're going to go over. Now, this kills any momentum that the superstar who ideally should win would have just because what are the fans going to do anymore? Like we cheered you all the way up until the point where you got your opportunity and then you lost. Like, where do we go from here? So that leaves that character in limbo while the person who shouldn't have won kind of is still in a position where they probably shouldn't even really be in. 
For an example, when Triple H decided he was going to win against Booker T at WrestleMania. Reason Booker should have won, they did way too much to him throughout the whole storyline with the racial undertones and, and the people like you versus people like me thing. Like, that was a huge opportunity for booker t to become an even bigger star than he was and later down the line they gave him an opportunity to be a world champion and he killed it to be honest but but he also did it as a heel and at the time versus triple h he was like a white hot baby face and there was like the sky was the limit for him and triple h decided that same day that he was going to go over instead that's a burial of booker t's character now there are other people who are famous for doing this like john cena versus Versus the nexus was kind of crazy he literally took out like i want to say three members just three on one by himself when they were a young and up and coming team and that was their biggest match to that point he didn't need that win at that point he was like i want to say a 10 time wwe champion or world champion so like he didn't need that win now i mentioned these two because they're actually famous memes old memes of like wrestling and the wrestling community was really one of the first communities to have memes and stuff like that where it was like cena wins lol or triple h where instead of the sledgehammer in his hand it's a shovel and yo i'm not gonna lie it's pretty funny okay so next on the list i have the good old potato other people know it as being stiff in the ring but i love saying the phrase he gave him a potato now being stiff in the ring is pretty much like hitting people incredibly hard and i get like yeah they're, they're supposed to get hit in the face and and a lot of people may not think they get hit in the face at all but no there are some wrestlers that like want to make contact and being stiff isn't always a bad thing like sometimes it's to sell a match even more like there are tons of promotions that actually allow wrestlers to have a stiffer match just because it it goes to show more emotion it goes to show more physicality and it in turn can give you a better product at time other times it can be a little hard to watch and a stiff blow could be anywhere from like a kick to the gut or an elbow to the face like there there are no bounds to being stiff in the ring now sometimes it's to sell emotion sometimes it's payback from a wrestler being hit too hard previously like for example and there's countless stories of wrestlers getting their quote-unquote payback just because they felt like they were hit too hard so they decided all right i owe you one braun Strowman was still within like the first year of his singles career i don't want to say he was green but he might have been a bit nervous being in like a main event type of match uh for the first time so he kind of knees brock lesnar in the face way too hard and brock lesnar returns that with like a punch to the side and then a solid cross to the face and he told him to slow the f down now there are some wrestlers who are actually notorious for being stiff in the ring like jbl his clothesline from hell look at it every time he's really trying to take their head off every time hardcore holly was also someone known to be incredibly stiff in the ring he actually terrorized some of the tough enough contestants back in the day and was like actually kicking their ass during training it was kind of hard to watch actually so also in my notes i have vader japanese wrestling as a whole because they just that's their style of wrestling they do more hard impact like strikes and it's actually pretty cool to watch like i'm, I'm not a huge fan of japanese wrestling but i do check it out every time they have like a Wrestle Kingdom. It's always like a huge feeling. It feels like a completely different event than what you would see anywhere else. So this leads me to the next one on the list. We have putting someone over. This is essentially the opposite of burying someone where you're agreeing to let that person essentially build their legend off of beating you so just like i mentioned triple h and john cena previously i do want to give credit where credit is due and on the later part of their careers these guys really did start to put people over especially like the younger talent like roman reigns both of these guys put roman reigns over and that did help roman reigns increase his star these guys both put over seth rollins and that did so much for his career especially cena when they were going like for the united states championship and the wwe championship at the time like 
those matches were incredible and i was always surprised that seth was getting the wins that he was getting like it was pretty it was pretty cool to see john cena actually lose and that was like around the time where he first started losing now he's putting over younger talent all the time now triple h is booking younger talent to not be so lopsided the way that it was when he was wrestling so i will give credit to where credit is due it doesn't take away from what they've done to all those other superstars in the past but they are doing some good work nowadays so next on the list i have a hot tag so a hot tag is typically reserved for faces it's not a heel oriented type of scenario but it does involve the heels um usually the heels are beating up the baby face on the other team and they've got him down and out They've probably hit him with like 10 tag team moves and four ref distractions. So at this point, the baby face needs to tag out. And that's when the fresh baby face in the corner gets tagged in and he does his signature moves. Now, if you've ever played any WWE video game in the past 10 years, then most superstars have a comeback move in that game or in those games where you do a sequence of moves and it's usually like the fan favorite moves of that superstar and that leads them into having enough momentum to do their finisher it's the same thing in real life so this is where john cena's five moves of doom usually comes in this is where the rock would come in do his like three punches into a spine buster into like the people's elbow like this is where baby faces get the crowd going they get super hype and either the match is coming towards an end or the match is just starting to pick up okay so next on the list i have blading and blading is a little self-explanatory um now back in the day in order to really sell more of the fight wrestlers would bleed during the matches and sometimes they bleed the hard way which to them would be you know actually getting cut open from a hit that they took during the match other times they would hide a blade somewhere throughout the match or just on them sometimes the referee would have the blade and at some point they'd get handed the blade or they'd go grab the blade from under the ring and they'd make little cuts on their forehead in order to bleed during the match now it's been famously overdone by a lot of wrestlers in the mid 2000s like eddie guerrero rick flair is always bleeding i mean you name them triple h Shawn michaels batista i've seen randy orton do it like it was just it's what they did at that time in order to sell more emotion for the match it, it used to get the crowd even more excited it used to sell more tickets because you knew it was going to be just this big bloody show now i like to believe we've come a long way since then but blood is still useful in order to sell a story more i feel like these guys how much do these guys hate each other if they're not even willing to make each other bleed storyline wise and as long as the wrestlers are safe while doing it you know like making incisions on your forehead during a match while your adrenaline's going kind of doesn't sound super healthy but i mean if it just naturally happens then i say allow it a lot of times as soon as they get like a drop of blood on the mat they're rushing to clean it up and like cover the superstar's face and things like that things like that i think are unnecessary so next on the list i have the go home show this is pretty simple i just know if you've never heard the term before you might be confused it's the last show before a pay-per-view it typically consists of like a bunch of cliffhangers leading into the pay-per-view and it's supposed to be a super the most interesting show throughout the month because it's supposed to build the most intrigue into what they've been building towards the whole month which is the pay-per-view now there was a time between like 2018 to 2020 where they were like kind of overdoing it with the pay-per-views so it seemed like every two weeks it was like a go home show and it did lose its specialty it did lose like the feeling of oh there's a pay-per-view coming or a premium live event i'm sorry like there wasn't that much generating around the premium live events 
but now they have put in so much effort into every show that every show feels like it's must see like i felt like i needed to see backlash i feel like i need to see elimination chamber coming up like these were considered b shows in wrestlemania SummerSlam, royal rumble survivor series those are your a shows so the b shows seems almost just as important as the a shows now so i really i'm giving them props for that because it's a great time to be a fan right now so next i have the gorilla position and this may seem insignificant at first because all it is is just the area right before the curtain before they walk out but so many things have happened in this area where it's like you gotta mention it because it's it's frequently talked about throughout the community like there's a time where brock lesnar threw a championship at vince mcmahon there's a time where Chris Jericho checked Brock Lesnar after Brock Lesnar busted open Randy Orton at SummerSlam. There's times where Vince McMahon told Kevin Owens, like, they're not good after the match with Chris Jericho at WrestleMania. Like, so many things happen at Gorilla because that's where Vince McMahon used to watch the show when he was in control. Um, that's, when the, that's where the showrunners are, pretty much. They're right there. So a lot of things can go down. A lot of wrestlers hear news at that position so it's gonna be a lot of times where you might hear that if you're listening to wrestling stories it's actually named after gorilla monsoon because he used to stand there to watch every pay-per-view and every show so i guess they eventually named it after him so that's a fun fact i didn't even know that myself so last on the list i have a dark match and as a kid a dark match always sounded so cool until i found out what it was it's just like an unaired match that you're not going to see on television. That's it. That's it. I thought it was like a literal match with no lights or something like that. I don't know what I thought it was, but I was super disappointed. I'm like, this is just an unaired match. But yeah, it's used for development talent mostly. Sometimes like top talent will send the fans home happy with just one more match after the show or even before the show. But yeah, it's primarily for like developmental talent for them to be in front of a crowd and get that experience, be in front of the cameras, even though they're not gonna be aired on television, like you still want them to practice their camera angles, where to look, where not to look. So it's useful in that perspective. But other than that, it's not that much to a dark match, I guess. I was pretty disappointed. So I've actually been to like five or six shows throughout my lifetime and i believe i've seen two dark matches one was ryback when he was first getting started the other one wasn't really a dark match but the rock and stone co kind of bandered with the audience after they faced the nwo in a handicap match on raw in like 2002 i was five so I don't remember too much. I do remember them being in the ring and on the mic. And then they were, I remember them walking towards the stage. And I believe The Rock put on Stone Cold's vest. And that's all I remember from that night. It was my first show ever. I actually want to watch Raw and review it and see if it jogs any of my memory. I was literally five years old. We'll see what we can do. All right, guys, that's enough for today. I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, I'm hoping that this is helping you guys out with your wrestling lingo and just having conversations or just listening to stories and understanding them more. Um, again, thank you everybody for the support. Please leave a like, subscribe for more. And until next time, keep it cosy.